Okay, terrific. Um, thanks very much. Um, I want to talk about the rise of platforms and what this might mean for our field of researchers, political communication researchers, basically about the role of companies like Google and Facebook uh, and how we can think about our work going forward in the world in which they are increasingly important. By platform companies, I mean large technology companies that have developed and maintained digital platforms that enable interactions between at least two different kinds of actors that are in the process of having these come to host public information, organize access to it, create new formats for it, and control data about it, and who thereby influence the incentive structures around investment in public communication, including by news media, political uh, uh, campaigns, and social uh, movements. So, we're not talking about technology companies like Hewlett Packard, but companies like Google and Facebook and smaller platforms like Twitter and Snapchat and their counterparts around the world. So, um, what do we already know about their role in political communication? Well, I think we know first of all that platforms are increasingly integral to at least a small part of almost everything that almost everybody does almost everywhere, including many parts of political communication processes from the production of content over its distribution, to its consumption, and to the actions that follow next. So simply put, in that world, if we don't also study platforms, we are studying the past and not the present and future of political communication. We live in a world today where in 2016, Comscore estimated that in, in the US, for every minute Americans spent on the websites of all organizations classified as news and information providers, they spent two minutes on websites from Google and four minutes on websites from Facebook. In the process, these companies have become increasingly central to the distribution of, for example, news. So in the 2017 Digital News Report survey, about uh, half of respondents across 36 different markets across the world identify search or social media as their main way of accessing news and information online. So at the individual level, we should of course expect this to lead to differences in what news is accessed, how much news is accessed, by whom, and we know from a growing body of work that the effects, at least at this stage, it seems, are often very different from what is assumed or asserted in public debate. Contrary, for example, to the filter bubble hypothesis, work by Augusto uh, Valeriani, Christian Vicari, my colleague Richard Fletcher, and others have shown that search is associated with incidental diversity, social media is associated with incidental exposure, in both cases driving more diverse news shoes and the use of social media is associated with incremental increases in online political participation. Now, as Kirsten Thorson uh, powerfully reminded us earlier today at this very conference, this does not mean that these forms of consumption are not unequal, much of the world is, uh, but they might be marginally less unequal uh, than self-selection. Now, at the institutional level, we should also increasingly see how the main actors that we have traditionally studied are increasingly intertwined with platform companies. Shannon McGregor and Daniel Kreese have shown this for the case of political campaigns. Young Mi Kim and her colleagues in their powerful work on political advertising on Facebook. Andy Chatwick and work by Sarah Ann Gander and myself has shown how this is also the case for news organizations. And Alex Segerberg and others have looked at this in the case of social movements. So it's clear that platforms like Google and Facebook are not simply arenas for political communication. They're also actors. And they're part of very different socio-technical assemblages including some really nasty stuff that with our white hat bias, we have not always probably given the attention that we ought to. So, questions, next, what don't we know? Well, um, I think at the individual level, we need to test our findings in a range of different contexts, as with all other forms of media use and media effects, we can't assume that findings will be the same in every country. Furthermore, I think we need to continuously address some of the same basic questions, like the filter bubble hypothesis, because these tools change all the time in important ways. And then we need to look beyond the old platforms like search, which is 20 plus years old, social media, 15 years plus, and to private messaging apps and the like that are growing rapidly, especially in the global south. At the institutional level, I think we are only really beginning to look at this. And there is much more to do here, especially comparatively. We cannot and should not assume that large US-based platform companies have the same relations with, for example, political campaigns in, for example, India, as they do in the US. There are, they are active across hundreds of different countries that they operate in, and we should study their institutional relations there. So there are lots of questions. What, then, um, are the opportunities and challenges that we face? Opportunities first. 
I think, first of all, um, we can start from the strengths of our field. Um, our commitment to looking both at individual level, uh, short-term attitudinal and behavioral effects, uh, as well as uh, in, uh, institutional level structural changes over time, our commitment to empirical work, to rigorous research designs, and the embrace of both quantitative and qualitative methods, and an op opportunity, if you will, to learn from our mistakes. So in the development of this part of our journey together as researchers, let's skip the part where we grow so focused on the short-term and individual level attitudinal and behavioral effects that we risk losing sight of the institutional dimension. And let's not end up in a methods-driven place where we confuse the distinct advantages of some methods for some questions with some sort of imaginary general intellectual superiority. We all recognize that the institutional long-term implications of the rise of platforms are as substantially important as a short-term individual level once. Yet this is not something we can study using randomized controlled trials or online experiments, however powerful these tools are for other purposes. So let's study it in other ways. Let's start with problems and questions rather than with methods. And when in doubt, always ask, what would Paul Lassesfeld do? And of course, the answer to that question is, what would Lassesfeld do? Lassesfeld would do everything, and ideally he would do it everywhere. So instead of only working in this corner of Lassesfeld's famous table of media effects, Let's be the whole table, shall we? So, finally, the challenges. I think, first of all, we face uh, some serious challenges around methods and access to data. And I think we are at a very interesting point here in our journey as a field where some of the most important methods in political communication research, like content analysis and surveys, are challenged by changes in our object of analysis. And other methods are ascendant, like computational uh, methods applied to digital trace data, and qualitative inquiry into socio-technical uh, processes. So take content analysis, for example. How do we deploy this method when we are increasingly moving from a world of mass media with standardized products to a world of personalized feeds serving increasingly serving tailored or at least A-B tested content? Or surveys, for example, powerful as they still are, and I believe they are very powerful still. Recall has its limitations when it comes to reading a daily newspaper or watching the evening TV news. So how far can surveys take us in a study of fleeting glances at news content discovered incidentally while within a social media app? Then there are the questions of access. Ironically, perhaps these questions are least pressing from our, for our, our inherited methods of content analysis and survey research, and most pressing for trace data and qualitative work. The asymmetry here between the proprietary data available to private companies and that available to researchers is enormous and growing by the day, and while we have been able to do ethnographies of political campaigns and news organizations in the past, it is not at this stage clear that we will ever see an ethnography of a platform company, for example, for reasons of access. Secondly, um, it's clear that political communication, including both campaigns, news media, political advertising, and social communication, is often a very small part of what very, very large platforms enable. We fundamentally don't know how much exactly, on average, or for whom, but in light of estimates by firms like Comscore that only about 3% of the time that people spend on the web is spent with news sites, Mark Zuckerberg's figure that about 5% of Facebook's news feed is news-related, and in the future 4%, is not implausible. Nor is Google's number reported in 2012 that out of 100 billion search queries every month, they generated about 3 billion clicks to news sites. We don't know, but these are not impossible numbers. It's a small part of very large platforms. Third, I think the challenge we face is one where we need to get beyond our comfort zone. We've been latecomers to the study of platforms compared to our colleagues in other parts of communication research. It was easy to dismiss search as a tool for research and idle curiosity and social as a tool for socializing and entertainment. But both these and other platforms are increasingly integral to much of political communication and we need to start to get beyond our comfort zone to benefit from the insights of those who did get an early start and who've been at it studying these platforms for years. So as a field, I think we've often been very good at drawing on the political side of the extended family, political science, and I think it's important that we at this particular juncture are equally good at drawing on the communication side of the extended family and learn from all the amazing people who have uh, been studying platforms for years and developed theoretical vocabularies and methods for getting to grips with the complexities of our current predicament, rather than just ignoring it or resorting it to polemics. So you'll all have your own favorites, and I don't want to commit too many sins of omission here, but let me just say I personally think that today 
in a world in which platforms are ascendant, the work of communication researchers like Dana Boyd, Jose van Dyck, and Charlton Gillespie is as foundational for understanding political communication as the work of Doris Graeber, Tim Cook, and Helen Mancini. So let me just end with this plea, which I think is a very hard sell in a room full of academics. Let's go read some more books and go study platforms. Yeah.